let's take the scientific materialist worldview at its very base. Okay, at its very base, we are basically balls of meat wandering through the universe with a bit of self-awareness attached. We're sort of Spinoza's stones that have been thrown, and we know that we've been thrown. We don't have control over our own behavior. We don't have control over what we do. We don't have the capacity well, no. to react. No. Well, first of all, many people who would take an evolutionary picture of ourselves also imagine that we have free will. I've never understood that perspective, to be honest with you. Uh, I'll put the free will piece in play here, because actually, actually I think there are moral insights we can have when we see through the illusion of free will, which we, we really can't easily have without doing that. And then I, I want to bring you in here, Eric. <laughs> very, very patient. Not falling for that twice. <laughs> well, I mean, I think one of the, part of the problems, one of the problems is, is that in some very weird way, because uh, Ben is wearing a kippah, uh, we think of him as being very orthodox, pious, and religious. In fact, I'm always struck by just how much he has choose uh, any appeal uh, to text in his public argument. So for functional reasons, uh, I very often see him in a largely atheistic context. I find, Sam, that you're always focused on um, what is, to my way of thinking, very clearly a form of Judaism, uh, expressed as atheism. <laughs> um, and that's, that, that really does sound anti-Semitic somehow. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll have to ask my rabbi how I just got insulted. I don't know, Sam, how much are you being paid tonight? Uh, uh, <laughs> and, you know, as much as I take a scientific worldview, um, I find that if I'm really honest with myself, uh, I have a lot of uh, certainly dialectical tensions that I can't resolve needs for meaning that I can't find easily met within the rational systems. I think that the is and ought is, is a good distinction. I think a lot of this has to do with uh, pre-existing architecture that predisposes us, uh, even though our rational minds may know better, uh, towards something that functions very much in an as-if religious context. Well, let's just take is and ought for a second, because I mean, here's one way those two things collapse for me. If understanding how the universe is altogether, you know, all the possibilities of experience, all the ways minds emerge, all of the kinds of good lives and bad lives and all of the mechanisms that would determine one path over another, a complete understanding of, of the mind and the cosmos. That's all, that's all the is, all the is there, that is there to be understood. If understanding that couldn't give you a complete picture of what you ought to do, where would you go to get that picture? If you sum all the facts, how does that not give you a way to chart your course in this universe? Well, what, what else is there to inform your life? Well, there are these things that we notice in our minds that we can, you know, that run through our fingers like quicksilver that aren't exactly facts, these intuitions, these things that gnaw at us, even though we know the answer, we feel superstitious, we feel guilt. You know, how many, economists talk about utility as a one-dimensional object, uh, but how many kinds of utility and disutility, I can be happy, I can be interested, I can be fulfilled, you know, all these different ways of tagging, mm. you know, utilities and disutilities. And if you just notice your mind, um, you'll notice that there are all sorts of things going on in it that really aren't about aren't about facts. And I don't know where they originate, neither do you. But, see, what, what, but just, just translate what you're saying, sure. I mean, how I'm hearing what you're saying, you're, you're telling me facts about the mind, which I, I agree with. I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's kind of a facts. Congress I mean, in you there. You guys decided that there was like objective reality uh, when you were having that conversation. Hmm. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose that there's probably objective reality, but I think that a lot of what goes on is, is that we've been in the shallow end uh, of science where more or less, you know, me and let's say this gentleman over here uh, share uh, enough that we can probably agree that the square root of two is provably irrational. I believe that that's probably an objective fact, but I don't believe proof checking is objective because we have things like the Amabi problem that sit in the literature for years and we think it's proved, but it turns out we didn't have the right proof. You know, so we have situations in which We've been picking low-hanging, easy fruit to, to console ourselves that we, we can all get at the objective reality. We've all seen optical illusions where, you know, some color is exactly the same wavelength, but it looks two different mm. ways because of the surroundings. Okay, but, but, so that's, that's a great example. Just, let's well, linger there for a second. So, right. so 
again, we thought we knew what we were talking about, and then we mm. find out at a deeper level that we didn't, and then we think we know what we're talking about again, and then it can reverse again. But, but that move to the deeper level mm -hmm. is more facts. It's more context. It's more objectivity. Right, but we, also, we already agreed on something that turned out not to be true as objective right. fact. And well, then, so so this, this, the point is, is that I'm not entirely sure uh, in any of these. Like, if I take the irrationality of the square root of two, there's a concept called not worth worrying about. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. Well, that does a it's, lot of work. It's just not worth worrying about whether or not somebody's going to find a mistake in that proof because it's so short. You know, when it comes to something like the ABC conjecture, you know, it's been going on for how many years? We still haven't, you know, gotten our, our arms around it. We're now not in the shallow end quite so much. And so my concern is, is that it doesn't do a lot of damage to say we can prove that the square root of two is, is irrational and that that's an objective fact, hmm. up until you start trying to extend that, you know, to more and more complicated proofs. And, you know, then it, it actually matters that the original concept was the outside proof may exist, but proof checking isn't objective, and therefore we may never exactly know, but there are things that aren't worth worrying about, and we call them objective fact for convenience. Sorry, All right, I don't well, want so, to well, so, so let, let me make a, an objective, what I think is an objective claim of fact, that I think has moral, that, that you won't agree with, Ben, that I think has moral consequence that we should grapple with. So that, and it's, it connects to a, a very real world issue like wealth inequality, right? So wealth inequality is a problem if you think it's a problem or, or it's inevitable if you think it's inevitable, but it's, I think everyone would agree that some level of wealth inequality would be intolerable and that we would want to correct for it, but Wealth inequality is just one kind of inequality. There's every other kind of inequality. And there's this fact that, w that none of us, and this, this goes to the free will issue. So, so what, we, what we imagine is that people, they have some, a certain inheritance. They have, they, they have their genes. They have their environments. They, you, know, you, you didn't pick the fact that you weren't born yesterday in, in Syria. You, you, were, you were born in a stable society when you were born. We, don't own, we can't truly own all of our advantages. We didn't make ourselves. But most people feel that there's something like a ghost in the machine that has free will that can make the best of even a bad situation. Now, I think you probably agree that some situations are so bad that you know, the deck can be so stacked against you that, you know, it's just life is unfair. I think, I mean, here are claims about you that I, that, that I think are true and have, have kind of, should be morally salient. You didn't make yourself you didn't determine anything about yourself that you would use as an exercise of your own free will. So you're, you're very intelligent, you're very literate, you're very interested in things that get you ahead in, in all the ways you, you've gotten yourself ahead. You didn't create that about yourself, right? And obviously there's, there's a genetic component to that, there's an environmental component to that, there's a, maybe there's just you know, cosmic ray bombardment that can help mm -hmm. or hurt. Who knows what, what influences are there, but none of that is something that you have authored. And that's true of everyone in the room. You have exactly the disposition you have, the effort you have. If you wake up tomorrow morning with twice the capacity for effort and grit that you had yesterday, you won't know where that came from. If it, co if it comes from a book you read, you can't determine the fact that the book had precisely the influence that it had and not a little bit less or a little bit more. Well, you are part of a system of influences. And so this is a picture, in my view, that just makes a mockery of the notion of free will. Right, it, it, and it's, okay. it goes down to the, the smallest mm -hmm. possible case of you know my getting to the end of the sentence. Right, right. it's just you know, like if, if I have a stroke now, well then you know sorry I can't do it, but I didn't, and I didn't choose that either. So now that I think I think it, it, taking that on board does not rob us of morality. I think because we, because we still have a preference between an excruciating plunge into civil war and, and needless misery and building a viable global civilization where the maximum number of people thrive. So You're like, using a lot of active verbs for a person who is no, but we're, a we're product active. of environment and genetics. Well, no, but, no, but it's, all, it, it's all happening. Like if I were, we, we can build robots that act, right? And we are, I'm moving my hands now, but I honestly don't but know how. But is the how. robot moving the hands? Or, right. I mean, is it, I, but the, the, the point that I'm making is when you say we can, we can discern, we can build, we can create, we can, you know, we can decide. 
But it's exactly, is, like, is, it's exactly like you speaking now. You, are, you don't know how you follow the rules of English grammar. I'm not, I'm not arguing that you can't make a convincing case that I don't have free will. I'm arguing that you can't make a convincing case you can build a civilization on lack of free will. Take this case, uh, I mean, the moral relevance of this, and Eric, I'd be interested to know if you agree with this. It seems to me that once you admit you, you either won the lottery or you didn't on some level, that conveys a kind of ethical commitment or an ethical obligation that you wouldn't otherwise have. You can't be the person who, who then Why? says everyone just is basically you're, you're on your own. You either make it based on your effort or not. I mean, this goes to questions of, you know, should we have universal health care? It's, it's not just an economic Again, you're, you're answer. Going, you're going directly from is to ought with no stop on the train at all. Well, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's just... It's, for, for, for literally decades, there, there were very wealthy and very sophisticated countries that took the premises that you are building upon and built some of the most repressive regimes in history. Well, right, no, the but idea they, that, but they, had, they had other things going on. They had bad ideas of economics. I agree. They had, they had well, personality cults. They but, had... Uh, I agree with all of that, right. but the point that I'm making is that you are, you are making definitive statements about value judgments with reference to a naturally selected interaction of, of biology and environment. I just don't know how you're getting from one to the other. Owning the, the truth of biology does I mean, do not... Do robots have morality is what I'm asking you. Well, they, that, they, they, is, they, is, no, they certainly would if we built them to have conscious states that, w that could allow for suffering and well-being. I mean, that, that's coming. We're going to have to so, ask that question. Right. So then we can be God, but God can't make us those kind of robots? Is the argument? Well, no, but... but should, we, is, should we maybe try taking the fun out of this? I thought I was trying. <laughs> so, you know, one possibility is that there's like a layer cake, and at the bottom you've got, you know, quantum field theory, and then you get organic chemistry and you build this thing up and mm. you've got natural and sexual selection and then you get you know systems of morality writing on top of this and there's some sort of weird category er error between the layers of this cake so it may be that uh, if you can get rid of uh, quantum uh, indeterminacy that you have effectively Laplacian determinism and everything is a uh, product of initial conditions uh, and that takes place at the lowest level, but there's no morality at the level of, uh, you know, exciting fields and electrons and quarks. So, you know, you don't put, pair that observable, which is like, you know, that, right. that quark is being unethical right now, uh, <laughs> you know, with some behavior, which, you know, affected whether some synapse, you know, fired. And so that's, that morality thing has to do with this very high up layer, which is some sort of social organization, which is, not fundamental. And so what, what I hear us doing is talking about free will down here, and talking about morality up here, and you know, one of the lessons of, of, of physics is, is that you, every layer of the cake has... Well, it has its own language game associated with it. And yes, we make, call those observables, yeah, right? Yeah. So those observables are paired with what we might call effective theories, right? And so these effective theories are not to be mixed up. And so every time we get into one of these free will conversations, I don't know whether you're talking about free... We have as if free will. Who, who was forced to buy a ticket to tonight's event, you know? Well, no, so, well, no but answer that question, really. So, like, so like, like did, did, you, did you actually... I didn't have to buy one. Yeah, well, they, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, the night, the night is young. You guys should yeah. totally get in yeah. on this. <laughs> um, but, but the point is, is that I'm perfectly happy with the idea that I have as if free will at the top of the layer cake and, and uh, if we can get rid of uh, quantum observation and get back to Laplacian determinism at some higher level that I have no free will. But, but it's as if free will only because you actually are not aware of the proximate cause of your action in each yeah, moment. I mean, if I look at a chaotic pendulum uh, over at the Exploratorium, it may have a very clear uh, path that's determined through Newtonian mechanics, but I'm not smart enough to figure it out. So effectively, I'm su super surprised. I just sit there like an idiot, twirling it, thinking, oh, wow, I didn't think it was going to do that, you know, even though I know the physics, right? So, right. so the, the point is, is that if I try to compute something that's much larger than I am, my computer can't handle that much larger system. So, you know, this is why sort of self-reflection leads to madness very often. And... Uh, <laughs> I thought you said but this was going to be fun. Really, hopefully it's not that often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm still really interested in the app that you're coming out with for meditation. <laughs> um, yeah. don't, um, don't hold your breath, but it is coming. Okay. Yeah. But, but what I'm trying to get at is, is that the fun part of these conversations comes from making these category errors. Uh, and the unfun part comes from sorting it out. And then, you know, when, when, I, when I've played Johnny Raincloud, 
everybody will say, well, okay, I guess that makes sense, but it's no fun anymore. And so that's, that's what I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. Well, but you would still, you're not disparaging the idea of a unity of knowledge, right? You're not, at each layer of the cake, you can make a smooth transition between layers that doesn't Maybe you, that I usurp your compute. understanding of each layer. I mean, I have a fair idea um, when my wife's going to be angry at me for not doing the dishes, but I can't recover it from quantum field theory, right? Well, so the idea is that maybe that the quantum field theory determines her behavior. No, but, you're, but there's nothing about doing dishes that, it, that violates quantum field theory. You hear one, that? One, I mean, one presume. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, so it's, it's not that you have to live in a different worldview in order to talk about the human relations layer, the, the, the moral layer, the free will layer, or not. I can do my best, but I, I don't find it useful to try to think about human psychology from the point of view of... Uh, of quarks, of, yeah. of quarks, yeah. but, you know, can, could organic chemistry, if, if, if some neurotransmitter is depleted, yeah, you know, so, so there are some ways in which these different layers can talk to each other, but there's no reason that I should be able to compute necessarily across these layers successfully, even if there is some sort of concept of entailment or, or determination. What I'm interested in is kind of a first principle methodology of moving forward into the unknown, right? So like it was, so the, the, what, I, what I object to in religion and in this notion of revelation is that there was some prior century where we were given the best ideas we're ever going to have on a specific topic, and we must cling to those ideas until the end of time. This is the analogy that, or the, the rubric that, that I find most convincing. I, I, it's like there, there's, there's only ever been people talking about reality here, right? And you can, so you, therefore you can either locate yourself in a current, modern, open-ended conversation, or you can anchor yourself to an ancient one and never so, give yourself the freedom to rethink it. So, and, and you could have done it with Homer, you could have done it with Aristotle, you could have done it with Shakespeare, and the Hindus have done it with the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and you're, you're losing no sleep over whether or not you should do likewise, right? And so I, but my sense is that we need to... Every question of, of societal importance requires that we now outgrow the accidents of merely contingent history outgrow the fact that people used to be living in geographical isolation from one another and linguistic isolation from one another for centuries and outgrow, therefore, our religious provincialism and just get to a common humanity that's using the best tools available to solve the hardest problems. So I have a couple of quick responses to that. The best tools available are all predicated on assumptions that can only be made about human action and that you fundamentally reject. Again, Things like reason, well, but, things but, like free will. Why are we having a conversation here tonight? Why did anyone show up here tonight? Okay, but this is a philosophical confusion that, that you're... Let me try to just address it. Reason does not require free will. Reason requires a... Convincing me. Ha having a mind that can follow an argument and, but, and can care about whether or not you're following it. But me responding accurately. to your argument is not a matter of choice at that point. So what's it's never, the point? But, but it's, the thing is, reason is never a matter of choice. If I convince you... Then why you, is reason superior to amygdala response, passionate amygdala response? Well, because one, it, it's scalable. It? One, it's, it's, it's... If I give you sufficiently good reasons for anything, right. you will helplessly believe what I believe. It won't be a matter of choice. You never choose what but you why believe. But why are you giving me those reasons? If I prove to you that... Again, I, you're using a lot of active verbs for a guy who has no capacity to choose himself. Well, no, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing... Uh, no, no, no. That, 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 you're using my language, and then you're building a house using the bricks that I'm giving you. No, no, the, to stick with reason, the, the one brick. <laughs> reason is a mode of, of influence whereby if you, if you see the, the syllogism actually runs through, right, or that to speak of reason even more broadly, if I give you a, 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 a set of facts that persuade you of something that, that before this moment you were unaware of or thought was untrue, you will helplessly take that on board if you're reasoning, right? So if, if I show you that two so plus two makes four and you can't see it any other way even though you wish it made five, you will helplessly believe that two plus two makes four. You don't choose it. You never choose it. So I have kids. You have yeah. kids, right? Do you have kids? Yeah. We all do. Yes. All of kids, great. So when it comes to free will, I get it. I'm completely on board, Sam, with your idea that there's no free will. No. When it comes to raising kids... Where's don't the... tell them. Don't tell them that it's 
So I have, a, I have, you know, I have an 18-year-old boy who's, you know, gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And when I'm trying to tell him to do the right thing and he does something stupid, and then I want to find out why he did that. I don't even ask because it's a stupid question because he doesn't even know why he did it because mm-hmm. he's an 18-year-old boy. But when I'm looking at impacting his future behavior, where's the practical separation between knowing that there's really no free will and wanting your children to be responsible in right. their behavior and what they do in the world? Okay. Well, I mean, this is an important question. I, I think there are many false assumptions about what it must mean to think that there's no free will. So I, I think there's no free will, but I think effort is incredibly important, right? And I, I think there's, there, there, you can't wait. A, I mean, the example I use in my book, I think, is, you know, if you want to learn Chinese, you can't just wait around to see if you learn it, right? It's not going to happen to you. I mean, there, there's a way to learn Chinese, and you have to do the things you need to do to learn Chinese. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Every skill you, or system of knowledge you could master uh, is like that. And Getting off of drugs is like that, and getting into shape is like that, and straightening out your life in any way that it's crooked is like that. But the recognition that you didn't make yourself and that you are exactly as you are at this moment because the universe is as it is in this moment has a a flip side, which is you don't know how fully you can be changed in the next moment by good company and good conversations and reading good books. And you don't know what, I mean, you, you, are, you are an open system, right? And we, it's just a simple fact that people can radically change themselves. You're not condemned to be who you were yesterday. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of people who are totally off this message, like someone like Jocko Willink, right? The Navy SEAL who's He's like the opposite of me in every respect, right? And, and so even on this question of free will. He, he's scared of you, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, so he's, he's all about effort and, and discipline. And it's all true that all of all, you know, discipline matters. Discipline has consequences. But again, in each moment, if you put on Jocko's podcast tomorrow and it changes what you're going to do with your day by 25% and it's crucial to your happiness... You, again, you're not in a position to know why it, it did that that day and didn't do it last Thursday. And you, you're not even in a position to know to, why you turned it on, really. And again, you're just, you're open to the universe. But again, there's immense freedom in that. It's not, you're, you can keep going in the direction that, that you, you want to go. But as far as to what to tell kids, you need a strong sense of agency. The, the measure of what to tell kids is what's, what to tell anybody ultimately is what's true and useful. Right? It's not just all that you just don't download random truths because some truths are, are, I think, not worth knowing at certain moments in life. Right? You don't tell your eight-year-old about all the ways in which human beings can become diseased and die early and you know, childhood cancer is on the menu. And you know, Do you want to talk about that now? That's not, there's, there's too much reality at certain moments. And I, mean, I think empowering kids to feel like they can seize the reins of their lives is, is worth doing. I mean, assuming that there is no free will, the parental machines that are pre-programmed to communicate that there is free will to the machines that have no free will that are their children, those, those machines will do better. So probably you were sent right. here by, uh, by Laplacian determinism to ask this question so that we could respond without choice to tell you <laughs> <laughs> tell you to lie that. Yeah. Yeah.